All right, so my name is Josh Long. Very nice to meet you guys. I am a designer and a writer. Both of those things mean multiple things at the same time. If you want to uh, get a hold of me, the best way is to go to the Twitters, Josh Long. All right, so a little bit about me. How many of you know who I am or have heard of me in some form or fashion? Awesome, we're all, this is like a virgin shot. All right, good. Um, so. I write some books. In the last eight months, I've written three books. One with Mr. Drew Wilson, which was called Execute. Uh, how many of you have read that book? Wow, more people have read the book than know who I am. That's interesting. Um, all right, so, <laughs> so I'm a bad self-promoter, apparently. Um, I wrote a book called Genius, which was a business book for creative people and also people that can't spell. Um, and then I just finished up, or am finishing up, the manuscript just turned in for a book called Design Evolution for Five Simple Steps. You guys know who that is? Mark Bolton's company. Um, that's going to be really cool. So that's almost like a follow-up to execute in a lot of ways. This is more about um, letting a product evolve into a business. So it's very much a business book, and they pushed it to be heavier and heavier in business. So if you've had... Uh, an idea that you really like and you've gotten minimal traction on your first beta product, this would probably be a decent book to pick up. I'm not partial. Um, I do a couple podcasts, which apparently is a trend of sorts now. Um, I do a podcast called Happy Monday with Sarah Parmenter, who is a very lovely lady from the UK and a talented designer and a good friend. Uh, Drew and I do an execute podcast. Um, I would objectively ask which of you like it, but I'm not going to embarrass myself. Um, I do a podcast called Treehouse Chat, and I am actually going to be on the industry radio show with Drew and Jared now, so that's going to be fun. Uh, some projects. <clears throat> this is going to, you guys are going to think I'm like Michael Keaton or something with this multiplicity thing, but Drew's taught me a lot. Um, I'm the editor at Treehouse. Uh, how many of you know who Treehouse is? I'm going to ask you a million questions during this thing. Awesome. That's great. Awesome numbers. Um, yeah, so we have an app for uh, teaching people uh, how to do web design, development, iOS, uh, Android, things like that. Any kind of digital product, which goes pretty good hand-in-hand -hand with Execute. Uh, now I have Execute Ventures with Drew. It's something that spawned off from the book itself. Uh, Paul and Kelly are here as well. They're partners with us, and they're doing all the uh, filming and video. And Amir, who, is Amir here? Ah, oh, almost. We almost had a family together. And I'm pretty excited to uh, announce this, too. I promise I'm not going to talk about myself the whole time. Um, I just got picked to do a two-week project build with Seth Godin. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's a well-known author. Does some pretty cool stuff, like the Domino Project, Squidoo. Um, sold his company, Yo-Yo9, to Yahoo for however much money they do that for. Um, so that's pretty cool. Seth Godin has always been a hero of mine. He actually did the opening for Execute Books, so that's going to be really cool. Uh, I'm also joining the team at The Great Discontent. Uh, Ryan and Tina are good friends of mine. You guys read The Great Discontent? No? Yeah? Yeah, check it out. It's one of my uh, absolute favorites. And then uh, the industry, of course, with the industry radio show and industry.cc. Uh, I'm also working on an app uh, that's going to be called Simplecast, since I'm doing so many uh, podcasts. I'm working with a developer named John Buddha up in Chicago, and we are building something that will just allow you to hit a record button and hit go and have a website and everything for a podcast. So if you want to start doing podcasting, which a lot of people do, but you don't want to have to worry about building out sites and everything else that goes with it, it's kind of like a 15-step process, so we're going to try to make it three. And then I have a project called Project Intern, so that's obviously a working name, but um, it's a product that's going to feed... Um, any design interns that want to go into medium-sized firms like uh, Paravel Inc., Trent Walton, that kind of size firm, we're going to be facilitating that and um, really placing some people in some good companies from that. Uh, we're going to be doing Execute Magazine, uh, which this will no doubt be a part of. You'll hear more about it later. Um, the Execute Blog, so that's something that I'm working on redesigning now to uh, help everyone uh, build as much as they can. So let's get right into it, right? Execute Story. So... I was on the industry radio show, go full circle, right? I was on the industry radio show about being the editor at Treehouse and a couple other things I was working on. I met Drew, I mean, met Jared 
uh, while he was at Treehouse and sparked up a good relationship. So had me on there. I got to meet Drew. Uh, didn't really have that solid of a conversation because we were obviously recording a podcast. But about two weeks after that, he launched Spacebox. And I still have the tweet. I probably should have done it. But I sent Drew a tweet and I said, hey, that's a really great app. Five days to build an app. Great story. So I, uh, I tweeted at him. You know, That's how a lot of our projects and products start in this industry, right? And uh, you know, two weeks later, I tweeted at him, thought it would make a, good, uh, make a good product, a good story a lot of people could learn from, me included. And uh, man, we decided, all right, let's do it. We had a conversation on Skype. We said, if we're going to do this, we have to do it the same way that we built the, uh, or that he built the app. So uh, we decided, hey, we're going to do it in a week. And then we had our oh crap moment, but we were moving so fast that it didn't really bother us so much. So. Um, fast forward a little bit, I did a two hour Skype interview, Drew, which I still have recorded, so I might have to put that out, it's pretty funny. Um, is anybody here, Drew, I don't know if you remember this, one of the first things we talked about in that conversation, someone bought the book, right, so we decided to do the book, put up the site, and we did all these pre-sales and had the book basically paid for before we even wrote the first word, and one of the first people to buy it had a company called Deuce Industries, I don't know if you remember that. So we were, uh, is anyone here the Deuce Industries guy or girl? No? All right, that was an interesting one. All right, so, so we're chatting. We, we talked for about two hours, and I just picked Drew's brain apart. And I said, you know, like, why did you build this thing? What were you thinking while you were building it? How did you approach it? Why did you make certain design decisions? Why did you decide to use this architecture, you know, like I just really, I just pulled them apart and dissected it. You know, that's one of the best things I think we can do to learn anything is just be as curious as possible. So um, I put the spotlight on him and put him through the ringer. And, uh, you know, that's what happened with, uh, that's what made Execute. So about four days after writing, we decided, you know, we had seven days to write the book. The first day was gone because that was the day we spent talking about it and putting up the site. Uh, with about three days to go, I sent Drew a message and said, Drew, I don't like where it's going. I scrapped the entire thing. And I, I think you might have even tweeted out, Drew, is like, Josh has lost his mind. Um, so with three days to go, I buckled down. And uh, I'll talk about this a little bit too, but I literally sat in my room, normal hours, right? So I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And I work till about 5.30. So I have a rule about stopping at 5.30 because of my family. So no like super crazy hours, but it was a moment of really, real super focus. I mean, it was, I listened to the same song. I'll never forget it. It was The Wand by The Flaming Lips on repeat for three days. And just cranked out this song and sat down and just poured everything out and uh, finished the book in three days and you know we missed the deadline by one day we needed one more day for the um, the printer itself to have it ready but long story short um, idea to execution of a product a sold product for that matter not just the idea and in a beta version of it but actually having everything completely sold uh, in eight days it was uh, it was pretty slick so now you know throughout the whole thing Looks a little weird up there, but and there's Trent Walton talking about his book, going to execute this book. I didn't know if he was going to read it or burn it, you know? I was like, what do you mean? You're going to kill it? Um, so we just, we continued to get a flood of these pictures of people in their execute books. That was Jared's. Um, and, man, I can't, I can't describe the sensation of seeing something like this, like everybody just pulling things in. We're getting stories in from people. Uh, Jeremy, I know you're here, man. Jeremy said that his, he read the book, got to executing on a project, said his brother used it to like start learning to whistle. You're going to have to explain. Where are you, Jeremy? There you are. Yeah, you're going to have to explain that one to me. So he wants to whistle. And then you gave it to your mom? I didn't see that one coming, you know, somebody's mom reading execute. So, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. We get these stories, and, it, it, and I say that not to, like, talk about how great the book is, but to talk about, like, momentum. You know, when you ship a product and you get feedback on it, 
it's very intoxicating to see feedback, even good, I mean, even bad feedback, right? Like just having some kind of sounding board about what you're building so you can keep going and keep building on that. Uh, an interesting note about these photos, I didn't put them in here, but girls apparently like to read the book in the bathtub. So I was getting like a ton of photos of girls like, you know, the one leg up shot. And literally, I, I bet I got like 16. I was like, okay, so our demographic, a certain demographic of our product likes to use it in the bathtub. Um, so yeah, so we, these things just keep flooding in, you know, it's just great. I mean, I think that someone gave it to their uh, boyfriend for Valentine's Day. That's love. <laughs> That's love. My, my wife wouldn't do that. She'd be like, I'm going to buy a massage that you can give back to me. Um, so yeah, these, you know, these photos just keep coming in, man, and it's, it's great. And something that's even better, I had two in there. Something that's even better than seeing everyone reading the book is how many people sent us stuff that said, I've been trying to get this done for a year. I read the book and I finally did it and boom. You know what I mean? Like that's what it's really about. And it's multiple stuff. Matt, are you here? Minimalytics? Yeah, there you go. He's one of them. Uh, Jeremy's been shipping like crazy. Um, it's just, it's so rewarding, man. You get to do this thing and everyone's shipping stuff and you're like, wow, this actually made a difference. We had Swiss Miss. I took a screenshot of this on my iPhone. That's all, I thought it was really cool. You know, like this simple idea that Drew and I had and it just, it kind of turned into this thing, you know, and I've tried things, I mean, I've tried products and things in the past. Um, you just never know what's going to hit, but it's really nice to see some kind of vector or a virus kind of build behind a product. So we're having a good time. So this is kind of the, the uh, you know, eight word shot. Close enough. Um, so happiness is building what you want the moment inspiration hits. So that's the mission that we wanted to, to hit with this book. And I guess, you know, the, the freedom that we have and the things that we get to put out, that's really what we wanted to project, right? And there's a lot being said inside of this because one of the things that I've been hearing a lot lately, and I, and I think it's, it's kind of a, a scary path to go down, is that a lot of people are talking about the leap, right? Go, go work for yourself, take a leap, take this big risk and not work for anyone. And something that I've learned a lot since I've been reading this, or since I've been writing this and going through it and talking about it, is that not, not everyone is an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? And that's kind of like a different, a different context. There's a lot that goes behind that. We talked about that in the book, everything that goes behind a product. But the one thing you can do, no matter if you work for somebody or anything like that, is you can make the things that you wish existed. And that's really, that's like the thing that's driving me and anything that I do and the passion that I'm trying to instill in as many people as possible. Um, just building stuff for yourself is so rewarding and like Drew and I talked about before is just you can't it's impossible to fail right if you're building something that you wish existed you have it you can use it and you know happiness is a mix of our need for work our need for validation and our need for creation and when you have this in your mind I think it's really a good way to go through life and be a weird human being so let's talk about inspiration Inspiration is the process of being mentally, mentally stimulated to do or feel something, especially to do something creative. All right. Inspiration is the single most powerful form of energy we have as creative people. Inspiration is a beautiful thing because, you know, it, it's, it's a mystery, right? Like everyone's always talking about, like, I'm not feeling inspired right now. I'm working too much. I'm working too hard. I'm not open to inspiration. But... The, uh, the truth of the matter is, is that inspiration can be absolutely all around you. It's just a matter of being open and, f and giving yourself a framework to be open for inspiration. And even more so than that is to get, get to work on that inspiration because it, it keeps, you know, inspiration begat inspiration, so to speak. I mean, it just keeps going. And without inspiration, creativity, it's very hard for that to happen. And without creativity and inspiration, 
you know, we're, we're out of a job in a lot of ways. Um, so our, our thing that we like to kind of put out there is that inspiration combined with the need or this feeling of survival from procrastination, right? And this, this dates back to survival of, of trying not to get mauled by a saber-toothed tiger kind of thing, right? Like, you, see, you hear all these stories of people having all this adrenaline energy and all these things, like when there's, when there's pressure on them, when they have to do it, they can do things that they have never been capable of before. And even when we were in school, how many of you procrastinated on projects when you were in school? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's so many. And I think that the power, the energy that we get from inspiration, if we can combine it with that kind of survival energy and power in procrastination, I think that's where we can get to start executing things. And, you know, when I say procrastination, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, too, because what are we talking about? We're talking about a, a time constraint and getting a lot done in a short amount of time. Procrastination can be forced. A lot of times people think of procrastination as like a, a lazy thing, right? It's like you just keep putting, off, putting it off. But I like to look at procrastination as a way to take a deadline that you normally would have done and slide it up the scale. You move procrastination up and force yourself to do something. Uh, and that kind of leads to perpetual inspiration, right? If you, like I was just talking about before, if you put your inspiration into, into work, it, you get this feedback loop, and you keep going through, and you get inspired, you get inspired, and it gets you through the hard times, man. It gets you through the, the times where there's a part of your project you don't like so much, um, and then you kind of find what you do like about it, go back, get back inspired, come back, put out a product, push a very simple version, uh, or a, a new, uh, like, you know, 1.2 or something, and get that feedback, and try to get yourself in a loop of perpetual inspiration to get through certain projects. Um, because that is all about momentum. And honestly, in our field, momentum is everything. Drew and I were actually talking about this last night, is that you know, we kind of have crazy lives right now. I mean, we, we still, Drew and I are, are good about restraining our family time and stuff, but as far as our work time, it's, it's nuts. I mean, I'm, think, I'm pretty sure Drew would agree with me. Like, there's so many projects, so many things going on, but it's momentum. It's a vector. There's things happening. You just go with it. You know what I mean? There, there are times to sit back and learn and to listen, and there's times just to do stuff and just go with the momentum. So, um, you know, momentum is, you know, just the lifeline, I think, once you've acted on inspiration, just to keep it going. Like, staying, staying creative, staying inspired is a very hard thing to do. Uh, and I talked about this before. Build for yourself, right? The only way you're going to be able to solve really, really good problems. Like client work is like this, right? Like you have a client, you have to do everything you can to understand them, but you have a short time frame. So a lot of times it's, it's really hard to understand and build something for someone that isn't you, someone you don't completely understand. So building for yourself is going to lead to a, a really good product because you understand you for the most part um, without a psychiatrist. Um, but, you know, building for yourself, like I said before, you can't fail. And even if you do, you still have something to use. And chances are there's a really, really good number of people out there that share the same challenges and problems that you do. And you know, a lot of people argue with me about this, but I really aspire or I guess subscribe to the uh, Kevin Kelly's uh, Thousand True Fans. Have you guys read about this? No? Oh, awesome. I feel like an evangelist or something. Um, so a thousand true fans. Basically, his argument is when you build something for yourself, there's going to be a small group of people that have the same problems you do, same, share the same worldviews, have the same interests. So his argument is that whether you're in music, film, building digital products, art, anything that you do, if you can take the time to cultivate just a thousand people, like, like stop this thinking about millions of users, I want to be Twitter, I want to be Facebook, and just like really hone in, spend time with like a thousand people. And his argument is if you have a thousand true fans, people that will buy every album you put out, every poster that you illustrate, then you can sustain yourself for life on a thousand fans. So when everyone else is like trying to really push for this like million users and this mass audience, it's, it's more work, it's harder to maintain, and it's just cooler. You know what I mean? Our, our, everything that, that we see now in marketing is shifting a lot to this one-to-one -one thing. Like if you notice, if 
any single person tweets about the execute book or any other projects that Drew and I are working on, we answer it. Emails, everything, like every single one, no matter who it is. Um, because that's it, man. You, you build that base and you just, you love the people that are willing to take their hard earned money out and put it to something that you're doing. Um, so building for yourself, I think, is going to be one of your strongest strategies that you have moving forward in any design development work. Uh, build as you go. This is a big one, and I'll use the illustration that we used in the book, is when Drew built Spacebox, he originally had you know, massive plans for the first version of Spacebox. And ultimately, since he, since he built as he went, he put out this, the smallest possible version that he had, he ended up finding out that a lot of people wanted certain products and aspects of that product that he had other plans for, right? So now he's in this thing, and I'll get to this later too. I'll just go ahead and slide it over. He got to this point where since he had built as he went, he built something for himself, he was now in a position to have people to tell him what they wanted instead of taking a year to do it, and like this is the value of executing, instead of taking a year to do it and missing, he took five days to do it, put out a simple product, and now he has people that are paying him, like, or that are, yeah, paying him to build what they want while they're already paying him. And this, as a product builder, is kind of like the motto that I'm really like pushing for. Like to me, this is kind of like the holy grail of the web. Uh, if you can put this out and have people paying you to build exactly what they want, you know, the Venn diagram where it, where it matches what you want while they're paying you, like that's awesome. That's a way to get that, you know, perpetual recurring revenue and to support yourself. Okay, so I am often asked. Like, how can I be more creative? Which is really strange to me, you know. Since the book came out multiple times, I'll take Skype calls and emails and everything saying, you know, like, how can I be more creative? How can I execute? And really, to that, I say, do you have ideas, right? How many of you in here have ideas? Like, multiple, multiple ideas, right? Like, overwhelming ideas. Um, I mean, it's almost like, crazy, right? Like it's this thing that you can't turn off. Maybe not everyone in here is like that, but it's like these multiple ideas. Every time you hear someone say something, it's like, wow, there's a, there's a twist on that that can make something, you know, and you have ideas and notebooks full of ideas. Um, so, you know, what's the problem? And then they're like, yes, but too busy, boss won't let me, not enough time, you know, and we all feel that. I mean, how many of you feel one of these for what you want to build, what you'd like to see? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's the crux. But to that, I call in my youngest daughter, and this is what I say. You crazy. I love her. She's so beautiful. Her name's up. All right, so let's talk. Let's get to the crux of it, right? So after putting out Execute Book, getting feedback and everything, one thing that I realized, Execute talks about projects and products, right? And it talks about like executing on these certain things and then I naturally as it gets out there and you hear feedback, I started to dig deeper. And there is a, there's a larger problem than even what the execute book goes through. And that is executing your day to day. So the more that I looked into it, I realized that executing isn't necessarily coming up with a great product or project and just knocking it out. The key to executing is, is actually doing the one thing that we all seem to miss for some reason. How many of you in here are designers or developers, so you're designing some form of something constantly? Yes, yeah, amazing. So the one thing I propose that we have not done enough of is to design our day, right? Executing doesn't mean necessarily all these projects and products. Executing means showing up to do your work every day, man. Like, that's executing. You don't just say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of going through life right now. You know, like, executing is showing up day after day after day, hammering. Like, 
being very, very clear about what you want and hitting the same spot every day. I've been reading and doing a lot of research. Stephen King, I hope everyone here has at least heard of him, whether you're a fan or not, but he actually has the same desk, the same spot, the same setup, the same papers lined up everywhere. He listens to the same music every day, everything, same ambiance. And this is his way of like his body and mind coming together and understanding, okay, I'm sitting down to work. This is it. So every day he's like, this is my time to dream. So every single day he puts himself in the same state, which means he doesn't have to like prepare himself. He doesn't have to like check all these emails. And he, he just doesn't have to do all this little thing that we do. And that kind of brings me to a designer's day, right? Tell me if this sounds familiar. It's about 6.30 in the morning, and that's when you've hit 30, right? I mean, in your 20s, in your teens, you're getting up at like 12 or something. But So it's like 6.30 in the morning, well, let's say 7. Alarm goes off, it's work day. We reach over, grab our phone. First thing, how many of you, first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is check email or Twitter? First thing, right? You're already stressed out, first thing you do in the, in the very beginning of the day. So you're, you're checking emails, you're doing Twitter, you're afraid that you might have missed something like so crucial over the night, like someone has sent you something and you're just like, oh, it's just, it has to happen right now. So right away, in my opinion, right, this is just for me, I'm not trying to preach, I'm just trying to say it works for me, um, that's, that's defeated. And my, my cure for that, like, so I'm skipping ahead of myself, but so you check Twitter, you check email, you get some coffee, you decide you're going to go into work and you, you, can, you, know, you, tr you trickle into work. What do you do when you first get to work? Check an email on Twitter again, right? Um, and you're going to be getting yelled at by your boss. The second you hit, this is if you work for somebody, the second you hit the door, email, Twitter, uh, coworkers are coming at you. Project managers coming at you saying, hey, you know, this is what we're going to need. This is what we're going to do. This is what, you know, it's like bam, 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 bam. All of a sudden, you're like, you're spent, right? So my proposal is the best thing you could ever do is know your critical three. My critical three are writing, design, and development, right? Coding. So if you understand what you want to accomplish, Get it down to three things. I, time after time after time, with talking with people, interviewing people, you, it's nearly impossible to be really good and to nail everything unless you know what your critical three are. So you know the projects that you want to do, and you know the critical three things that you need to do. Have those hammered out, like super clear, man, like really clear, because it's so important moving forward to know what these things are. And then <clears throat> scrap email and scrap Twitter first thing. Don't even check it. If you know what your critical, three, your critical three things are, this is what has helped me to do all those pretty little projects that I showed you, is I started getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, which used to seem really early, but 5 o'clock is like this super sweet quiet time, right? So instead of doing all those things like checking Twitter and email, just knocking out one of your critical three things, right? Like 5 o'clock in the morning, quiet time. I can get more done between 5 and 8 o'clock than most people will get done in an entire day. It's just so quiet, you're focused, you're not even, you're no, no distractions, crystal clear on what you're going to do, and you sit down to work, you do the work. Um, so you got that three hour period of time, my kids get up, I get recharged, right? Recharge my energy, re-energize. My kids get up, I make breakfast for them, we have a good time. And then, you know, I go at about, you know, I guess between 8 and 9 that happens. So about 9 o'clock, I go to my office. And from 9 to 12 is another three-hour block of time to do nothing but what is critical. And, you know, this kind of becomes a routine. And it's amazing, like, what you can do. Like, I mean, imagine that, right? That's six hours of complete focus with no distractions, no emails, no, no people coming after you. And if you go somewhere else to work, like I have an office and I work by myself, uh, but if you have a workspace, that 9 to 12, if you explain to everyone that you work with, it's like 9 to 12 is my focus time, no 
no calls, no meetings, no anything like that in the, in the early morning. Let, this is how I work. This is the way we're going to get the most things done. And be very good at educating that. And push all that stuff to the afternoon. Like the morning time is where we're really, really, like that's where we have it all. We're not spent. If you flip it, which is what happens a lot of times. Our meetings are set for the mornings. Um, we do the email thing. We respond to emails all early, right? That's using up our best, best energy. And some people argue that late at night is really nice too because it's focused, but it's kind of like the same thing, but flip. And then your workspace. I talked about Stephen King, right? Workspace is absolutely crucial. So really, really focus on the place that you work. Stephen Pressfield wrote a really cool book about turning pro. He wrote one about the art of, or the war of art and do the work. And one of the things that he really got to is like this workspace, this, this space that we have that's like sacred to us, sacred to our work. No one else is in there. That's our space. That's our desk. Everything is just set out. That's where we work. That's where we do. We're professionals, right? That's where we go and we hammer this stuff out. Um, and it, it's so, so crucial. It's this moment of solitude, right? Like this, this space that we have that's sacred to get the things that we need to to get done. Because at the end of like a few months, a few years, without this kind of discipline, you end up asking yourself, like, what have I done with my life, right? The Execute book is one of the most significant things that I've done. I'm 34 years old, just turned 34. I'm going to die soon. <laughs> um, and, and Execute, you know, you knock that out, and you're like, wow, this is like one of the most significant things I did. And it took three days. What have I been doing with my life? And then you get depressed, and you drink a lot. Um, so yeah, so my, my kind of closing remark before I get to like some Q&A and stuff is executing at its core is about doing the work. Identifying what you love, what you want to see, right? Like what's wrong with the world in your opinion? What can you create that solves the problems and the things that you don't like about the world? How can you put those things out there, be inspired, and to keep being inspired to create your art. The reality of it is, is that people need what we do. And if we compromise what we do and we fit in, right, we make these things because we think they're going to make sense. We make them for other people. We make them just to make money. People need our art and they need our perspective. They don't need you to build something with some flat design, responsive, whatever, just to fit in, right? We need you. We need your opinion. We need your views on the world. And we need your art. So take what you can from life. Make your own, uh, you know, like rendition of what you see. Like put out what you interpret the world to be and what can make it a better place. And put out that art. Make it yours. There's a, there's a big enough people. There's a thousand fans for you to support what you're doing. So in closing, I would just say, Get to work. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so we'll do some Q&A. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have free water? Can I borrow that? Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to have so many different things. How do Jonathan you Moore. juggle going from one project to another? And like, how do you know when to, to set this one down and pick up another and not feel like you're constantly scrambling and shifting back and forth? You know, I, I, would, I would say that has a lot to do with you as, you know, as your person. Like, Drew, Drew does it and I do it, right? Like, you get inspired for different things, right? And you, you do feel, find yourself jumping, jumping back and forth. Part of it's discipline, part of it's knowing yourself and, and, and writing that inspiration when it happens. Um, but if you notice that I do a lot of different things, but if you really, really like dissected what it is that I do, I do certain things to support my family, right? Almost all of those things make money unless they're in production right now. So if my hands get chopped off, I have a podcast to do, right? Or I can still write. Like all of these things are diverse and different things. And I guess to get to the, the answer that you're after, I hope, is that I do things that are productive like for different reasons. I guess it's a way of me designing how, what life I want. And so 
so, like social life. I live in North Carolina. I'm isolated. I live at the beach. It's beautiful. I live on a golf course. I don't play golf. Um, but it's very isolated. No one in our industry is where I live, basically, right? So with the podcasting, it's a way to get paid to do some work, but also to socialize, right? So if you'll notice, like, different projects, I think, when you're switching back and forth, try to pick projects that are diverse enough that kind of, like, push you, right? Like, if you're playing basketball and you're right-handed, spend more time going to your left, right? Because it makes you more diverse, and it actually makes you better with your right hand because you can use your left hand now. So what I would say to that is try to have the product, all the projects you're working on, find out what inspires you, like where you get your energy, but also find out things that you can do that are opposite of what you were doing that can then feed back into that. Is that, uh, Just, is that I mean, Yeah, that's good. And then to like add a follow-up too, like how do you, do you try to hit certain milestones before you switch gears? So I get in the same situation where I'm super inspired, I want to jump over and do something else. Mm -hmm. um, but do you force yourself to hit certain milestones and, and goals before you jump over and do something yeah, else? Yeah, and that's a really good point too because that's about momentum, right? Like that's one of the things about execute is that when you procrastinate, it's, it's a negative connotation to procrastination, but it's actually a very valuable tool and a valu very valuable constraint. The reason you have to build things so simple, like the simple, the most simple possible version, right, or smallest possible version, is you have to hit milestones to keep momentum going. Like if you lose momentum in something, it's so hard to get back. I mean, how many of you have projects that are like a fourth or halfway done, and you're just like, eh, you know? Like you don't want to go to it. It's like work. You know, when I first talked to Drew, Drew said something that, that just, it's, it's so simple. I'm sure he thinks about it all the time, but it just resonated with me. A lot of people that I talk to have projects, and they're like, you know, it's just my momentum's gone. I'm halfway there. It just sucks. That's work. I can't stand it. But you talk to Drew, and it's like, hey, Drew, what should I do to limit my distractions and all that stuff? And he, he said, he said, when I'm building something, I'm so jazzed about it, why would I want to do any of that other stuff? You know, do you see the dynamic shift in that? It's like, we now make apps that cut our apps off. You know what I mean? Like, to, for constraint. That's ridiculous. And the problem is, I think if you find yourself, if you find yourself hating what you're doing when you started to love it, ask yourself why that is. You know what I mean? And then put these constraints in place that help you keep the momentum, help you keep inspired, keep you loving what you're building, and uh, just set yourself short-term stuff, man. So you're always accomplishing something. You're always shipping something. You know, if you wait till it's perfect, which there's an argument for that too, but if you wait till it's perfect, you're guessing and you're going to lose momentum. You know what I mean? Like it's very tough. And some people are disciplined, like really disciplined to work on something for two years without any results. I'm not like that. And it's it's painful in a lot of ways, you know. So I would say shorten the milestones. Accomplish Good. it, yeah. Make them short and do them. It's a long answer. Sorry. Anybody else over there? <laughs> <laughs> I will spear you with this microphone. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on how you've married procrastination and execution? They seem a little bit opposite in my mind. They Is do. it about like a sense of urgency? Yeah, um, and you got to understand when I say uh, procrastination, you want to channel the energy that you get from procrastination, that survival, right? Like I mentioned it earlier in, in high school, we put off these projects and you know, we'll, we'll tinker at it, we'll chip at it, but when it gets down to like the last couple of days of a project, most people wait for like the last three hours before bed to do a book report, right? You do so much in that small period of time, why drag it out for months? You know what I mean? Like, why drag out a project for two years because you have this grand idea of what you want it to be? Why not move it? You know what I mean? And use that procrastination energy. So when I say procrastination, I'm saying the, the energy that you get in the survival, like, that we go into to survive a small, short period of time to get something done because our boss is going to chop our head off or our wife's going to leave us. Um, <laughs> you just move it, you know what I mean? So that's what I mean. When it, execution is, stop thinking about procrastination as a negative thing and use it. You know what I mean? Use everything. Like, that's part of being a designer, right? It's, it's seeing the world differently than everyone does. So take someone's evil and make it your beauty, I guess. Back 
of a better term. Anybody else? Any questions about Beauty and the Beast? <laughs> Peace. Yeah, I learn from you guys, too, when we do this. So if you do have a question, please ask, because I think that's where people really learn. So Dan mentioned, um, like, all these deadlines he had, like five deadlines in one day. Um, do you agree with what he was saying? Because um, I feel like you're, I think constraints are good, but maybe you're adding gray hairs to your head. Do you, do you see that at all? Depends how you look at it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get the gray hair thing. I've been finding more and more every day. Um, but I don't, man, because I'm sure, some, I'm sure everyone in this room at some point has been in a position of pure elation about the work that they've done. Even if it's just a client liked it or it, they were put on some kind of showcase website for something they designed. Like, it's pure elation, right? And at the core of who we are, I believe we want to be makers, right? Like, if there was nothing else, we were cave people. We're making wheels, right? We're making things. We're, that's just who we are as humans. Like, that's what sets us apart, is that we can make tools. We question ourselves, like, what's my meaning in life? And we make tools. That's what, that's what humans are. So I think that... Can it give you gray hairs? Yes, but I also think that it gets you just pumped to keep doing things. You know what I mean? And if we don't put constraints on ourselves and we don't limit this, nothing's really going to get done. Like, we're weird, right? Like, we beat ourselves when it comes to this thing. You know? I mean, without being disciplined, we're going to think of something else to do. We're going to check on Facebook and we're going to make things important when we're open, when our minds are open to finding something else to be important. But if you're focused on what you need to do, that's important. And yes, I, I love those constraints. If you get a couple of gray hairs, it, the, the value that you get out of shipping things as a human far outweigh it, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, that's my opinion, obviously. Thanks. All of this is my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I would just say that it's not, uh, it's not Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. You can have both. Dan's talking about being super bogged down with work that you know was work, right? Josh is talking about something that gets you super excited, and even though you might have work, all you can think about is uh, the project, you know, so it's a little bit different there, but. Yeah. And even if you have work, you know, stand up for yourself, I think. You know, like when we talk about execution, I mentioned it earlier, you don't necessarily have to be an entrepreneur to do this. Like if you're working somewhere, stand up for yourself. Like if you, if you see something that's happening, we were talking about this at Treehouse the other day, right? We want to work with people. Like, no one on our team is on our team if they can't fight back. And respect comes from that fighting back and standing up for what you want to do. So if it is work and you're getting gray hairs from the work, part of that can be considered your fault. You know what I mean? Like, or our fault. Because, you know, executing can happen inside of a company. It's just you have to have enough gumption to fight for what you want to do. And if it's a client thing, like maybe you love what the client's trying to do and you want to execute and you want to take it on as if it were your own, you're going to be pumped about it. But you're going to have to fight for it. Like nobody's going to give you that. You know, artistic freedom is 100% earned, you know, unless you just want to go off in a, you know, small cottage and Walden Pond yourself or something. But um, is that it? All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys.